continue. We have to continue, and God's word needs to go out. So uh, praise the Lord for it. Uh, if somebody in the back could be, shh. Yeah, there we go. It's uh, a little bit later today, but that's all right. We've got timing, and uh, it was uh, worth every second that we had to wait. And uh, the kids are wonderful, and they need to know uh, they need to know about Jesus, His love, His goodness, His mercy, His coming, uh, and His coming again today. Luke chapter two, Christmas is coming again. Christmas is coming again, and um, we do have to preface on the fact that. Uh, we're so filled with tradition, especially in the Western countries like America, uh, about the story of uh, Christmas. We, you know, reindeers and all kinds of things and, and jingle bells and all that stuff. And, and people actually, this is a uh, uh, react to it, react to it because uh, people don't know what really happened in the story. Um, a lot of times even believers um, uh, get confused in terms of what actually happened uh, the day that Jesus was born. And, um, and people make a lot of controversy. Well, he wasn't really born on December 25th and all kinds of things. It, you know, I, nobody really knows when Jesus was born. We don't even know the year, per se. We don't even know the day. Um, people ask me why. Well, because nobody knows the day of his second coming either. Nobody knows the day or the hour of that day as well. So uh, we're left with just the reality that he did come into this world. Now, early Christians, the early church, the early believers believed that it was right around September right around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the reason why they thought that was because um, it says in John 1 that he tabernacled among us. He dwelt among us, and uh, they said that was a hint from the Gospel of John that he came at the time of the great feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Um, well, that's, that's interesting, uh, because if you do go back nine months from that time, you do end up around December 25th. Uh, so maybe the believers thought that was the day uh, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit into the womb of Mary. However you like it and however you want to put it, Jesus did come into this world to save sinners. Amen. And that's the most important part of the message of Christmas. Christmas is coming again. Luke chapter 2, let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you and praise you that you have come into this world to save sinners. And Lord, we qualify because all of us have fallen short of your glory and have broken your law, and stood in judgment, Lord, between you and us. But you came into this world, Lord, to redeem us from the law, from the curse of the law, from our sins, from ourselves. And you paid a heavy price. It was your life. But, Lord, we have this amazing account in how you arrived into this world. And it, it may not be how people like it. It may not be the fancy uh, shows and lights and things that people make it out to be today. It was very humble, actually, when we read it. And, Lord, that's the way you wanted it to be. And we accept it. We thank you for it. We thank you that uh, this baby came with the cross looming over him. And we do realize that, Lord, that that's the reason why you came. You came to deliver us from sin and from death. Uh, but, Lord, we rejoice on this account because you revealed yourself the first time uh, in a very humble manner. And you will reveal yourself again. And this time, every eye will see you. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that you are the Lord. Uh, Lord, we thank you for those wonderful things that you've written in your word. And we bow the knee today. Because we know, Lord God, that you are the Savior of the world. Born on that day in Bethlehem. And so, Lord, we ask you and thank you for today. Bless our brothers and sisters here who listen to your word. Who uh, are applying your word, Lord God. And are going to be like the people of old ready to receive you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So last week, we looked at the good news. And it was good news from Luke chapter 1, the story that involved a lot of people, a lot of women. We talked about that in Luke chapter 1. It was uh, uh, written by Luke and the account of uh, many people that were there. And uh, we looked at the story of Zechariah and the angel. That was amazing. And the story of two women, Elizabeth and Mary. And I told you that uh, you can't have Christmas without these two ladies, without these two families. And we don't talk too much about Elizabeth and Zechariah, uh, but they had a son. His name was John the Baptizer. And um, that's the beginning of the gospel. And we remember that he was the voice crying in the wilderness. And we ended with the fact that you can't have the gospel. You can't have the gospel of Jesus, according to the Bible, without John the Baptist. Can't have the gospel of Jesus without the message of John 
and he was the voice crying in the wilderness. Now, don't take my word for it. Read it. It's in the book of Mark, chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus is John the baptizer preaching repentance unto salvation, that people ought to be ready for the king, that he was the voice making things ready, preaching a, uh, that repentance will be for salvation, and that the gospel of Jesus would follow. And so you can't know Christmas without John the Baptist. People love to just rush into chapter 2. Uh, and it's a wonderful story. It's a very different story than John the Baptist. Uh, and it's a story about the birth of Jesus. Uh, but before chapter 2 came chapter 1. That's pretty normal, right? Um, and chapter 1 is all about the precedings of the birth of Jesus. John the Baptist, Zechariah, Elizabeth. Don't forget about them because they set up the whole theme of the book that Jesus has come into this world to save sinners. And John the Baptist prepared the heart. He prepared the heart by telling people the king is coming. You got to get ready. And the way you get ready is you need to start turning from your sins. So when the Messiah would come, he would take them away. If you first have to turn, then he takes them away and he gives you his righteousness. So we're going to read that today. Luke chapter 2. We'll read the first few verses, and uh, we'll go along with it, and uh, we'll go as fast as we can, because I know we're a little bit late today, uh, but without delaying it too much. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar, Caesar Augustus, a census will be taken in all the, inhabit uh, in all the inhabitants of the earth. So it's a whole global thing that they did. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register to the census. So Jesus has arrived. Jesus is going to arrive, and um, there's things that prepare the way for Jesus to come, including this account here that is very historical, by the way. This is not embellishment. This has nothing to do with uh, tradition. This is all people that live. They're very, uh, very much historical. All these men that are mentioned here, from Caesar to Quirinius uh, to Joseph to David, all these men lived in that, at that time. Um, well, obviously David lived before that, but they were historical figures. So the gospel is very historical. It's very true. It is not an embellishment. It is not some exaggeration. It is the reality of what happened. Uh, but God prepared a way for quite a long time. Now, we jump right into Luke 2, but we have to think about the Old Testament as well, that before this happened, there was the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we're told that God had prepared the way for his son to come. It says in verse 4, Joseph went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was from the house and the family of David in order to register Mary, who was engaged to him, and she was with child. So before that even happened, we got to think of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah prophesied long ago, 700 years before this event took place, that the Lord himself will give a sign. His name would be that there would be a virgin, and she will conceive, and his child, the child's name would be Emmanuel, and it's God with us. Uh, we forget a little bit of the story because we jump right into it. You get a Christmas card that says Isaiah 7:14, and you go, oh, that's wonderful. That's about Jesus. Well, Isaiah prophesied at that time that there will be a child born at the time of Isaiah. It was actually a child, and his name was Emmanuel. And uh, that child was supposed to be a sign to the king of Judah that uh, God was going to protect him. He was being threatened by Ephraim, the northern tribes. He was being threatened by Assyria. And he was threatened by all these nations around them. But God was going to protect them. And the way he would know is that a child was going to be born. And his name was going to be Emmanuel. That, of course, happened during the time of Isaiah. We forget that passage because we just think it's about Jesus. It is about Jesus. But it happened in the time of Isaiah. And it was a prophecy that ultimately in the future, 700 years later, there was going to be a virgin and she was going to conceive, and she was going to bear a son, and this son was going to be unique because he was going to be God coming into this world. He was going to be God with us, Emmanuel. Well, don't jump too far because the same Isaiah, two chapters later, Isaiah 9-6, tells us a little bit more of the story, isn't it? Now, we've all been accustomed to this as we all get a Christmas card with those verses most of the time. I don't think you get a card with John the Baptist's name on it, do you? No? That says repent? You don't get a card like that? Oh, well, it's part of Christmas I think we had to send them. I'm going to start a petition for that. Um, get John the Baptist cards and Christmas cards. But this verse is fantastic. It says that the child that is going to be a sign, he will be wonderful. He will be born to us, a son. 
and the government will be upon his shoulder. And this was big in Israel because they were under the oppression. They were under the oppression of Syria and Assyria and later on Babylon and later on the Greeks and later on the Romans. And so they were very glad that the governments will be one day will be upon this son and he will be called wonderful. The word wonderful there, it's a beautiful word, Pele. It means unexplainable, uncompre- incomprehensible, things you can't really explain. This child is going to be quite an impressive child. It's going to be difficult to explain why, because when you think about Jesus, he's quite amazing. Uh, you may understand the things about Jesus and who he is, but to really know him, you would really have to think, how can God become a man? How can God have DNA? How can God incarnate himself in human skin, just like you, just like me, breathe the same air, have lungs, have the capacity uh, to go through all the process of a human being and yet be the divine son of God, the incredible divine being who created the heavens and the earth, be composed in a human body and uh, walk around like if he was just like any one of us. But if you looked into those eyes, you saw God. Imagine that. Uh, I don't know how you could explain it. I could, I could accept it. I could believe it, as the scripture tells us. But I don't know how quite to explain it, how God can fulfill the human body and, um, and live on this earth and be just a man, and, uh, a man just like us. But that's how wonderful he's going to be. That's how unexplainable he's going to be. As I said, the, the, some Jewish rabbis in the early century, first century, there were believers. They said, you know, he was within our grasp, but he was beyond our finding out. He was within our grasp. We can touch him. People can touch Jesus. People can touch his robe. People can hug him. John laid on his bosom. But did John really understand that he was hugging God? Did John really comprehend that he was really touching eternity in a divine being made, uh, made to be a man? made to be a human being. He was beyond our comprehension. He was within our grasp, but beyond our comprehension. That was true of Jesus. In the incarnation and his divine being is so far beyond our capacity to really grasp. That's why he's wonderful. But he'd be a wonderful counselor. He'll be mighty God. He was the, he'll be the father of eternity. That's what everlasting father means. And these are tributes to, attributed to God in the Bible. So this is God. This is the Prince of Peace. He will bring the Prince of Peace, of course. But that's not only that. Actually, the Bible tells us where he would be born. 500 years or so before Jesus was born, Micah received this prophecy. And it was about the timing of Jesus' coming. He would come to a city called Bethlehem of Ephrata. And why does it have to be Bethlehem of Ephrata? Because there was three three Bethlehems. I don't know if you knew that. There were three Bethlehems, one in the north, one in the middle, one in the south. So which one? God said the south one. And if it was the other two, it would have been much more possible to understand because they were more famous. Uh, Bethlehem of Ephrata was a little village. It was just kind of had a couple of streets and a couple of donkeys, and nobody really cared about it. It was just, just had a couple of inns, and nobody really, you know, if you drove through it, you missed it, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, Bethlehem of Ephrata, they would come to you, the ruler, the one, the one that would come. God prepared this long ago. To you would come the ruler in Israel. Oh, boy, and people knew that. And uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 2 very quickly because uh, I want to show you that they knew. People knew this. It wasn't a surprise. It was just people were unwilling to receive Jesus. Uh, God had prepared this for a long time. There wasn't anything new to the children of Israel. Matthew chapter 2 tells us um, in Matthew, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. Now, tradition has it that there were three um, different, uh, they came from different areas, and there were three, and you kind of see them sometimes in your nativity scenes, and one of them was really dark and all this stuff, and tradition, tradition, but the Bible doesn't really say how many they were. In fact, uh, history tells us that the Magi's were um, wise men. They were people that knew about science, people that knew about literature, people that knew about religion, people that knew uh, about stars. They actually studied the stars. They were the ancient astrologers of the day, and they came from the area of medium, medium. They were related to the Kurds today. They were related from the people of Iran, Persia, and uh, they understood the prophecies. Believable. They were not even Jews. They were actually people from a long, 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 far away place. How did they know? Well, where is he, they said, who was born king of the Jews? By the way, they travel in caravan. They travel in caravan, meaning that they were quite a bit of them. We don't know how many, but there were quite a bit of them. History tells us when they travel, they travel in caravans. Uh, so it could have been 100 of them. could have been 50 of them. Enough to panic Herod. I don't think three guys showing up to Herod's palace would have uh, 
If you knew anything about Herod, he would have said, don't even let him in. But the fact that they came and Herod received them should tell you that this was no ordinary three guys coming in. Uh, it was a caravan. It was quite a bit of them. It says, where is he born king of the Jews? For we saw his star. Remember, they knew astrology. They knew things about the stars. They knew quite a bit of it. In the east. And we have come to worship him. When Herod heard the king, uh, Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Messiah was to be born? And he gathered all the priests. Look at this. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, quoting Micah 5.2, this has been written by the prophet, O you Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by the means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come forth the ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time that the star appeared. They've been following the star. A lot of people make it a big deal today about Ju uh, Jupiter and Saturn coming together. They call them the Bethlehem star. It doesn't happen every, but every 800 years. And um, it's an interesting thing. But back then, 2,000-some years ago, there was a star of the Lord who pointed the way. And uh, they knew. They knew from Numbers that there would be a star coming out of Jacob from Balaam's prophecy. And they knew from Daniel chapter 9 that the Messiah would be born right around this time, right around the time that the Jews had built the temple and had come back to Israel. They knew that from the prophecies of Daniel and the prophecies of Balaam, something was about to happen. By the way, they were not the only ones that knew. I want you to understand this very carefully. People had the expectation around this time that something was going to happen. God was going to send forth his Messiah. They didn't know where exactly and how. But the Jews knew. The Jews knew because they had the prophecy. See, Herod goes to the priest and says, yeah, it's going to be in Judea. It's going to be in Bethlehem. It's going to be up the road here. Six miles. Just six miles up the road. Now, you can you imagine if what's six miles up the road? Fontana, Rialto, things like that, right? You can, six miles up the road. Now, you can imagine, why didn't they go? If it was six miles on the road, wouldn't you just, hey, this is important. It's written in the Old Testament. The prophet said it 500 years ago. Get on your donkey and get on the road. None of them went. In fact, Herod says, uh, go check it out. Go check it out and uh, come to me and report to me. Verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem. Go and search carefully for the child and you have found him. Report to me so that I may come and worship him. Now, he wasn't into worship. He was into challenging kings. And a challenging king was an offense to Herod. And, of course, later on, he actually kills the children, two years and under. Well, let's continue. Go back to Luke now. Because long ago, this was planned. Now, Jesus did not come. Uh, God did not show up like he did in the Old Testament. In the Mount, you know, Mount Sinai, in the power, and the glory, and the, and the fire, and the earthquake. He didn't show up like that. He didn't show up the way he had done in the Old Testament. With lightning, and earthquakes, and power. Um, he didn't even show up like an angel. He didn't show up in the way maybe the Old Testament represented God. He showed up in a very unique and humble way, in the exact way that Luke tells us. And it's marvelous. No exaggeration. It says that there were people involved. Who was responsible for Jesus being born in Bethlehem? These guys here. Caesar Augustus, it says. Augustus Caesar. His name was Octavian. He was the first emperor to be deified within his lifetime. He was considered to be God, the son of God. We talked about that yesterday in our Bible study in Revelation. Uh, the son of Apollos, the son of Zeus. He was God, uh, basically, in human form. Hmm, sounds familiar, isn't it? They call him the son of God. They call him Soter, Savior. They call him the, uh, the one who brings peace, Pax Romana. He established it. He's a very interesting man who ruled from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. He knew quite well how to bring peace, military power. That's what Romans did, a military power, and he spent a lot of money to bring peace. So when you need a lot of money, guess what you need to do? Collect a lot of taxes. If you live in California, you know what that means. You collect a lot of taxes, and you have a lot of soldiers to keep the peace, and he did that. But it also tells us that he did a census. In order to have a census, you need two things. In order to have peace, you need two things. You need soldiers, and you need money. That's what the census was for. Who are the men of inscription? Who are the men ready to be, to get it ready for, for battle? How many are there? Well, you need a census. How much money are we going to have? Well, we need to know how much people make and what their businesses are like. And uh, so you need a census for that. This census was, of course, about keeping Pax Romana, keeping the peace in Rome. And uh, he did it as a census. So the arrangement of Jesus being born in Bethlehem 
happened long ago in an office in Rome, about 800 miles from Judea. The, 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 the Caesar decided every 14 years we're going to have this. Oh, it's time to have a census. Just ironically, just uh, coincidental, he decided that it's time to have a census. And it says, Corinus was the governor in Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census. So Corinus was the real power at the time. Now, Herod was there, but the real power was Corinus. The real power was a historical figure named Corinus, and he in invested in the census, and he brought everybody in. And of course, everybody had to come uh, to the place of birth, to the place of their family. And you see, that's why they travel. They travel, uh, this ruler, he was really in charge. He wanted to know their property, occupation, families. And of course, Jesus uh, was brought to Bethlehem. So the first time the name of Jesus was actually recorded, um, was actually in a Roman census, actually. It was interesting. First time the name of Jesus was ever recorded was in a Roman census. We don't have that parchment anymore. It's been long ago lost, but that's the place that their family was recorded to come. Now, Joseph made a decision. It says in verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee uh, to Judea, to the city of David. He was from the line of David, and to Bethlehem, because he was from the family of David. So was Mary. Uh, but Joseph, being the head of the family, he wasn't married yet, but he was uh, betrothed to her, and she came. Now, this is an interesting thing. Normally, you wouldn't bring your family. Normally, you would just bring the males and um, uh, the men for inscription, for, for battle, for taxes. Now, the Jews were not allowed to fight. The Jews were not allowed to fight in the Roman legions. They had an escape because they couldn't fight on the Sabbath. The Romans gave them an excuse. Can't fight, can't do it. So they were taxed double. They were taxed more than the other nations. So uh, here comes Joseph, and he makes a decision. He takes her in, go down 80 miles, about 80 miles. In that condition, why would she go? Uh, I, I think the reason why she had to go is because she had nowhere else to go. I think being in that village in Nazareth, being, being pregnant without being married and all the condition that she was in and all the shame that brought this amazing uh, conception was the fact she had nowhere to go except Joseph, except Joseph. And uh, Joseph says, we're going, we're going. Uh, they don't want you here. We're going down there. We got to go to Bethlehem anyway. And all this happened because God was intended for him to be born God was intended to mean to be born. It says in verse 6 that, that while they were in the days they were completed for her to give birth, she gave birth to her first son, and she wrapped them in cloth and laid them in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The innkeeper had no room. And at that time, of course, it was uh, people were traveling everywhere. Uh, they had to stay. They had to stay outside in the manger. They had to stay outside in the courtyard. Really, it was a courtyard. All the rooms, we, we have historical things, archaeological things have found houses, how they looked. And they had a big courtyard in the middle where they kept the animals. And they had a gate for security. And all the rooms faced the courtyard. And uh, if you couldn't get a room, you stayed outside with the animals. Uh, right in the, in the courtyard where all the animals stayed. And uh, they had feeding trough. They had feeding trough. And the word here that's used for the major, it's that very word, the feeding trough, where the animals ate. So I'm sorry to destroy... Uh, you know, nativity scenes and nice little nativity scenes and little wooden majors and all that stuff. I'm sorry to break the news to you. It wasn't that romantic. It wasn't that romantic. Uh, uh, you know, the stable and the straw and all the things that the people put up. And that's, that's okay. That's tradition. But the Bible makes it very clear this was a feeding trough. Now, who would want their kid to be born on a feeding trough with no room in the inn? Uh, certainly, there were more people involved in this than they thought, right? Mary, his mother, prepared him. It's interesting, uh, in, in first century, the mother didn't do this. The mother did not prepare the swaddling cloth. The mother did not prepare, wrap them in cloths and lay them in a manger. Uh, it would not have been her. It would have been the, um, what do we call those? Uh, uh, what is it? Midwife. Midwife. It would have been the midwife. She had no midwife. She had to do it herself. And by the way, the swaddling cloth, uh, again, I hate to destroy Christmas stuff, but maybe that's what um, we're reading the Bible for. They were actually diapers. This was a diaper. This was not a nice swaddling cloth. You see them in a major, and she's holding them, and it looks so beautiful. It was actually her diaper, his diaper, that she had to put on him. And uh, it had to be stretched out and quite long because it had to be, uh, uh, they used it quite a bit at that time. So all these things, all the preparations for what? The decision was not man. The decision was God's. God wanted that arrangement to be done that way. 
the unexpected, right? The unreal. I mean, who would actually go through this process of bringing his son into the world to be born in a feeding trough uh, with a teenage mom in an unknown city in Judea under Roman control? Only the Lord. God set it up that way. God set it up that way so that we know that it was not just coincidence. It was the hand of God. It was a hand of God to bring about his prophecy, his word that came to pass. Now, let's look at the announcement because there's great announcement here. Um, in the same region, there were some shepherds. Now, at that time, uh, shepherds were actually a, not a dignified vocation. Uh, uh, it, it is in Israel today. People do... Uh, um, People have shepherds today, and you can find them all over the uh, Bedouin world. Uh, but at that time, there wasn't very much uh, a dignified vocation, meaning this. A lot of the shepherds were actually petty criminals. They were actually petty criminals that couldn't find a job doing anything else. They could not uh, go to the court. They couldn't make uh, testimony in court. Uh, a lot of them had crime. A lot of them had a lot of things that they'd done that were wrong, and uh, they were mistrusted. It's the only job you can get if you were in that kind of category is to watch animals at night. It's the only job you can get. I know, the romantic story about shepherds laying right there, it's all gone. These were actually not very trusted people. Sort of shady characters were shepherds. They looked at them that way. Um, and uh, the only job they can get was to go out and watch flocks at night. Kind of boring, but that's the only, if that's the only job you can get, that's the only job you can get. And they couldn't offer anything, right? They were very poor. They didn't even have, um, many of them didn't even have homes. They actually lived outside in the field. And um, God sent them. God sent good news to them. And I had a question. This is good news, right? Good news. It's an amazing thing. Angels. Why not show up to Herod's house with the angels? Why not show up to people of higher class? These, these petty criminals outside, shepherds. Why would God make a message like that for them? Oh, I think it's important to remember. God cares for the sinner. God loves the sinner. God loves the criminal, the petty criminal, the people that are mistrusted. God cares for them and good news to them. This is what the book of Luke, remember I told you last week? The book of Luke has a lot of sinners. <gasps> you know, in a very dignified and uh, congregation, you know, that's a bad word. Just those sinners. Where, where are they? All right. Um, but it's true. God cares for the sinner. And Luke writes about it. And, uh, and they were in the fields. They were on the fields. And the very much the shepherds slept on, slept on that field, watching over the flock. It says, the angel of the Lord, verse 9, suddenly stood before them, and the glory of God shone all around them, and they were terribly frightened. I would be too. It was very close to Jerusalem, by the way, those fields. And uh, they slept there in good news for sinners. Remember I told you good news for sinners? The worst people, the shepherds, get the good news. Anybody know why? You know why God sends good news to bad people? You can shout it out. doesn't matter to me. No? No? Who needs a doctor? Sick. Exactly. Didn't Jesus say that? I think Jesus said that, right? I didn't come for the healthy ones. I came for the sick. Now, we're all sick. We're all sinners. But there's people that would not admit it. That's why Jesus didn't go to them. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus came for the poor. Jesus came for the destitute. Jesus came for the sinner. And if you qualify, he came for you. He came for me. That's how much he loves us. And the first people that get the good news, criminals. A pastor, I thought they were shepherds. Ah, I know. I hate to destroy the Christmas story. Um, they were sinners just like me and you. Petty criminals. They get good news. Praise the Lord for that. That God didn't go to the rich. God didn't go to the rich Carlton. God didn't go to the Kremlin or Washington, D.C. or Silicon Valley. He came to the poor. He came to the criminals. And it was very close to Jerusalem. That area was very close to Jerusalem where the shepherds, even to this day, they still have flocks there. And uh, they provided the lambs for the sacrifice in the temple. Just six miles down the road, those lambs that they watch over were the lambs that were used in the temple sacrifice. Every day, every year, uh, especially around time, a time of Passover, they provided lambs. And it's quite interesting that the very shepherds watching over the lambs that would be sacrificed were the ones who came to the Lamb of God who would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And uh, what did they say? The angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you the gospel. Good news. We're there. Gospel. In chapter 1, good news. Gospel. 
The gospel is here. The good news. What's the good news? Great joy, which will be for all people. We read that with the kids. For today in the city of David, that would be Bethlehem. These were the same fields that David would have been in. Uh, there's been born you a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, if you're a sinner, what do you need? A savior. That's what you need. That's what you need the most. Uh, you know, sometimes people need a bottle. Sometimes people think they need this. They need that. They need, they need something else. What people need is a savior. This is the best news they could ever have. And if you're a sinner today, that's what you need. You need a savior. The question is, do you really believe you are a sinner? People won't admit it. It's a pride of men. It goes back to the garden. We would just not admit it. What'd you do, Adam? Oh, it was her. <laughs> it was her, right? It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? Not mine. But they needed to know that it was the Messiah, the Savior, Christ, the Lord. Not just Jesus Christ, but the Savior, uh, which his name means Yeshua, means to save us, save us from our sins. Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the appeared in the angel multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. And the angels had gone away from the heavens, and the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem. What do you do when you hear good news? There's an acknowledgement. There's an acknowledgement of the good news. They came in a hurry, looking for the baby. They became the evangelists of the day. Let us go straight to Bethlehem and see these things that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. The shepherds were amazed, a wonder, uh, but it came to people, it says here, and they all heard it and wondered at these things that, uh, which were told by them by the shepherds. This is not interesting. Verse 18, I never read it quite that way before. The word wonder there, people heard the shepherds and they wondered, people wondered. And the word wonder, there's a one-time wonder. That just means a one-time wonder. They just heard it and they went, huh, interesting. And uh, as it were, people went on. And it, it is the same thing that happens to this day. People to this day, 21st century, get all worked up about, you know, holiday season, Christmas or Thanksgiving comes and people get ready. And you know what happens uh, nine days after Christmas? People go back to the way they are. People go back to the way they normally are. It's a one-time wonder. Ooh, lights, interesting Christmas gift. Maybe we'll go to church. Nine days later. It's like it never happened. That's the word here. The shepherds went, hey, the Messiah's born. Oh, wondered. But did they ever follow the shepherds? It doesn't say. It's a one-time wonder. People wonder today. Uh, you go out, maybe you visit your family. Maybe you go tell them about Jesus. This time of year is a fantastic time to tell them because people wonder. But will they care enough nine days later? Oh, people go back to normal. This is, this is not just 21st century America. This happened first century Judah. It happened then. And they went and they found the child. It must have been an amazing thing. Uh, they heard all these things. In the verse 19, Ma Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. Oh, there's someone different. Not just a one-time wonder, but a person who thinks about stuff. This is an interesting thing, and you'll find that. And this is why we must share the gospel with whoever we, whoever we can. Because there'll be people that'll be a one-time wonder. There's no doubt. People that will just go, thanks for the Christmas gift. Thanks for the card. Isn't it amazing? We'll get together. Nine days later, nowhere to be found. But there'll be people who say, remember what you told me last week? I thought about that. I thought about what you told me. I thought about what you said about Jesus. He did come. Well, yeah, Christmas. And what happened after that? Because I heard there's more than to the story than just Christmas. Oh, and people began to ponder. That's what Mary was doing. Mary was wondering, what does this all mean? Where is this going? I mean, the Messiah is born. People are coming to tell me. The shepherds went back glorifying God and praising God for all they heard and seen. For they had been told, uh, just as things uh, were told to them. Uh, the shepherds, there'll be people who praise God. See, the acknowledgement is always about people responding to Jesus. Some one-time wonder. Some will think about it and wonder. Oh, and then there are those who receive it right away and say, oh, praise God. He is born. And they go back praising, God's to the, praising God to their offices, to their workplace, to their schools. And they keep singing and praising God. Imagine these rough shepherds. These were not good dudes. <laughs> rough shepherds. And out there, you know, 
tattoos everywhere. Not the way I think about it, but it's my thought, right? Just rough guys. I mean, you could imagine petty criminals and, and rough guys watching shepherds, uh, watching sheep, and they come back and they're praising songs. And you've seen, you know, it's like going to the biker shop out here and they sing Joy to the World. You would wonder, what happened? Who told you? And Joy to the World and they're singing praises to God. Something happened. Just imagine that. That's how it happened. We don't think about it in those terms because we were so distant from the historical context of it. But that's the way it happened. Just tough guys singing praises to God. I would imagine people wonder, what's going on in those fields? What are they drinking up there? Oh, no drinking. Plenty of joy. Plenty of Jesus. Verse 21. Now, this verse right here, from verse 21 uh, to the end of verse 39, uh, it's probably the most least talked about passage in Christmas. And uh, remember I told you Luke chapter 1? Um, we we'll go to Luke 2 and everybody sings about it. But this passage here, uh, people go right to the Magi after, uh, from, from this to the shepherds, right? From the shepherds, they go right to the Magi. And they forget that there was a second group of people who met Jesus. And the reason why I think this is uh, forgotten, these passages here, is because it is very Jewish. It is very Jewish. In fact, this is probably the reason most Gentile Christians just kind of bypass and they want to go straight to the Magi. This happened before the Magi. All right? This happened before the Magi. The Magi came much later, months later. We don't think about it because we, we get the timeline wrong. But the, when Jesus was born, the shepherds came. Time went on. And then this happened. Then months later came the Magi. And we go right to the Magi, right? We go, oh, this beautiful story of them coming to Bethlehem. But this happened. It, it, is, it is very Jewish, and it's happened in Jerusalem. It did not happen in Bethlehem. It happened in Jerusalem. And uh, so before we jump to the Magi, we've got to think about this. There's a change of scene. Not Bethlehem, but Jerusalem. Six miles away. Not very dramatic. Not very sensational. No angels, no star, right? <laughs> Nothing like that. It's simply a story of Jesus coming to, Beth, uh, to, to uh, Jerusalem. And there's acknowledgement. And I think it has to do with this too. Pardon my, my little commentary on this. I think it has to do with the fact that we forget that Jesus is Jewish. I think we forget that Jesus lived under the law of Moses. That his family is Jewish. That his name wasn't necessarily Jesus, although that's what's been uh, translated to. It was Yeshua. And Mary was Miriam. And Joseph was Yosef. And they were under the law of Moses. And they were very much Jews under the law. And this is why sometimes we have a hard time connecting with the story. Because it doesn't seem to fit with our Christmas story. And where, how do you fit circumcision in? How do you fit temple? How do you? And so they all oh, would we'll just go to the Magi. But we have to be good Bible students. And we're going to go right through it. It says, when the eight days had passed. Again, very Jewish. Eight days after what? Well, uh, this is what happens to baby boys under the law of Moses. Eight days under the law of Moses says when the baby boy has become eight days old, they have to go to the temple and they have to be circumcised. They have to be circumcised. Before his circumcision came, uh, before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before she or before he was conceived in the womb. Now, why is that so important? Why is that verse in there? Because it signifies the fact that Jesus was not only born in, at the time of the law, but he also received the sign. There was a sign, and that sign was first given to a man long ago called Abraham. And Abraham was given a sign that this would be the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, that all your male descendants will, be, will have a sign. There will be a cut of the flesh. Your flesh will be cut out. The new flesh will be exposed, and that would be the sign to me, uh, Abraham, that you belong to me, to the children of Abraham. And it was a promise that if your children will follow me, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Not only the Jewish people will be blessed, but all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This was the inheritance. And it was passed on to Isaac, and it was passed on to Jacob and Joseph and his children and all the people down the road. And it put Jesus under the law. They were God's people now. Jesus take on, takes on the law of Moses. And every little thing in that law, now that person who's taken on the circumcision will take on the responsibilities of the law. 
Now, a baby could not keep the law, obviously, so the father and mother would keep it and teach them, teach their children how to keep the law of Moses. All those little meticulous things, they had to keep it until the age, anybody know, until the age of 12, to the age of 12. And what do we find Jesus at the age of 12 going to the temple, right? Exactly right. Because at the age of 12, every Jewish boy would take responsibility for himself to keep the law of Moses. All 613 commandments, all things written in the, in the, in, in the Old Testament, in the, in the law of Moses, I should say, from, uh, from Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, all have to be taken and they have to be responsible. And Jesus inherits this. Jesus inherits the blessings of Abraham. Yes, and if you believe in Jesus, you inherit the blessings of Abraham, the Bible says. The blessing of Abraham is for you, even though you are not under the lineage of, biologically, of Abraham. But by faith, the Bible says. But also something important. There was this. Galatians 4.4. 4. You want to turn there quickly? Galatians 4.4 4 tells us why Jesus and why this passage is so important. So important. Galatians 4.4. 4, Paul writing to believers, writing to Christians, telling us about... My favorite, my favorite Christmas passage. If you get a card from me, it certainly will have this one. That one to Revelation 12, and I'll let you figure that one out. Um, favorite Christmas passages. Galatians 4.4. But when the fullness of time came, when it was at the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. See, Jesus, by being circumcised, by being part of Abraham's children, is now taking on that responsibility of the law of Moses. He came, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as his children, as sons. Because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, and you will cry out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son... An heir of God, an heir through God. And that is an amazing promise that those who were under the law, but was like, Pastor, what are you talking about? Under the law, we're not even Jews. Oh, see, the law convicted every person of sin. Now, the Jews had it the most severe because they knew it. <laughs> they knew the law and they did not keep it. The Gentiles did not have the law, but they still broke the law of God. They still broke the law of God. So we've all concluded that we all have sin. And so the law is there to convict us of sin, to show us that we are not able to reach the standard that God wants for us. So what are we to do? Well, the Jews have to come under the law. Jesus comes and he's circumcised and he says, law, take it on. I'm going to take it on and put it on my back. And by circumcision, he comes under the law and at the cross, he dies to offer himself as a sacrifice for those who couldn't keep the law. And see, that's the beautiful part about Galatians 4, is that he comes to release us, to take away the curse for not keeping God's word. And every one of us has violated God's word. Every one of us in some form or fashion have done it over and over again. And therefore Jesus comes and he dies to offer himself. And the first occasion that he actually bleeds, it's here. The Bible says he was circumcised. Not a very, it's not a very fun subject. Well, the little boys don't remember it. Right? Not a very fun subject, but there's issue of blood. There's blood that is shed at that point. And the first time Jesus was ble that bled was at this place, circumcision, which connects it to the cross, which connects it to the cross because at, a, at the age of 33, Jesus was dying on our behalf. Because he fulfills the law, coming under the law himself, he's able to lift the curse off the law of the law from every one of us who trust in him. He lifts the curse and sets you free. And now you're not under the law, the Bible says, but you're under Christ. It's not about just doing whatever you want, but now you come under the Messiah and his leadership and his love and his care for you because he's lifted the burden. If you ever read the law of Moses, you wonder how is anyone is able to keep this? And we're all violating the law of Moses today. Uh, anybody worked yesterday? Anybody worked? Yes? Sinners, you broke the law of Moses. Anybody wearing a, a, a clothing of mixed material today? Bunch of sinners in church. You broke the law of Moses. 
You ever had wood rot in your home? You ever had termites in your home? Anybody? No? Yeah. Did you tear your house down? Did you tear your house down on, because of love for your neighbor? You didn't do that. All of you have broken the law of Moses today. Maybe today, maybe later, right? All of us. Anybody ate uh, uh, some carnitas or hot dogs, right? <laughs> Um, you broke the law of Moses. Well, what, what about a hot dog, right? Well, hot dog is all things, so you can, you know, that's everything in there. So you certainly violated the law of Moses there, right? All of us have violated the law of Moses in some way or fashion, even without thinking about it. But it's still the law of God, and you broke it. So in comes Jesus, who comes under the law at this passage, and lifts it off by fulfilling it, fulfilling it all. And now he can set us free and put us under his care, the law of Christ, the law of love, the law of the king, the law of the kingdom, right? Uh, and when you look at the law of Moses, you wonder, man, who fulfilled it? Jesus did. Fulfilled every one of them. 613 commandments. He did it all, all the time, never broke it once. Therefore, he's able to stand as our redeemer. He's able to stand as the perfect sacrifice to God, as a man who fulfills his word. And then on our behalf, he becomes our substitute, our atonement our substitutionary atonement, that those who cannot keep the law, who are not able to keep the law, the petty criminals, the sinner, right, the sick, those who can't do it, right, Jesus came for the sick, then he's able to lift it off of us so that we in him can fulfill it. So every Jew can fulfill the law today in Christ Jesus only. Every Gentile can fulfill the law of Moses in Christ Jesus only by faith and trust in him. This is amazing. It sets us free. There's no more bondage. And we're no slaves anymore. We're sons. We're children of God. No hallelujahs. Nobody's excited. And he even set free. You should be the first one shouting hallelujah. But the story's not done. Look what, uh, go back to Luke 2. Go back to Luke 2. Because it says that when the eighth day had passed, they brought the circumcision. That's what that means. And it says, when the days of her purification, of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, this is interesting because in the law of Moses, a woman having a child had to wait 30, uh, 40 days until she comes back to the temple and offers a sacrifice for, for her purification. She had given birth. There was an issue of blood. Obviously, there's lots of blood when babies are born. And therefore, she is ceremonially unclean at that time. So she can't go to the synagogue. She can't sing. She can't pray. She can't pray. Uh, she can pray by herself. But she can't pray in public. She can't praise in public. She can't worship. And therefore, she has to wait, according to the law of Moses, 40 days. So 32 days later, verse 22 happens. Their purification has to be done. And in order for that to happen, they had to go down to Jerusalem. They were there. So eight days, Jesus is born. They go to Jerusalem. He's circumcised, right? Then they come back 32 days later. <laughs> 32 days later for, for, for her purification um, to offer a sacrifice. And if, the, if it's a firstborn... And there's even a further sacrifice in a sense of now it has to be, they have to buy the firstborn back from God to them. Now, this is all complicated, right? This is why we don't like the story in Christmas. Because it's like, what are you talking about? In the Old Testament, the firstborn child belonged to God. This goes back to Moses and Exodus, right? When they were delivered, Passover, right? It was the death of the firstborn. From that day forward, God says, children of Israel, you're mine. I redeemed you. Redeemed you with the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed you through the Red Sea, right? A type of, of the cross and a baptism. You belong to me. In fact, your firstborn, who was not killed at the Passover because of the blood, belongs to me. And you have to redeem it back. You have to redeem it back. And you have to pay shekels, silver, right? The, the material of redemption. You have to pay five shekels to redeem your son. If you don't want to redeem him, he's mine. He's 12, at 12 years old, he goes to the temple, and he belongs to me. And he becomes a priest. Now, the Levites, of course, were the priest. So if you uh, wanted to redeem your son, you would have to pay in Jerusalem a fee to get your son back. It's all long story. We could do a study on that eventually. The redemption of the firstborn. It's called the redemption of the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn of the father. Of course, he's not talking about the order of birth, but the inheritance. He is the heir, and he delivers us. He redeems us. So this is a, a, a prototype of what it will eventually be Christ, the firstborn, redeeming us. But he is the firstborn. He's the firstborn of Mary, and therefore they have to redeem him. It's interesting. You find Jesus at 12 years old at, back at the temple. Um, 
you know, you offer them to the Lord when they're babies. And at 12 years old, they're like, what are you doing at the temple? Well, you offered me to the Lord. And at 12 years old, I belong to God. <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting how sometimes we forget what we've offered to the Lord. And uh, years later, the Lord reminds you, didn't you offer that? Did you offer your children to me? You offered them to the Lord. You, know, you bring them up here. We pray for them. You say, Lord, they're your children. We offer them to you. You love them. You care for them. I love them too, but they're yours. They belong to you. My marriage, my family, my job, everything belongs. Then we get worried, right? Well, we offered it to the Lord. Then we go, Lord, did we do that? <laughs> Can we buy it back? <laughs> and uh, remember what you offered to the Lord. It belongs to him, and he'll take care of it. He will take care of it. He'll take care of our children, take care of your job, take care of the things that you've offered to the Lord. How quickly we forget what we've offered to the Lord. Well, let's continue. That's a side note. Uh, it says, as it is written in the law, of Mo, uh, uh, the law of the Lord, verse 23, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So, pastor, I thought you said it was shekels. Well, yes, but God is so merciful. If you wanted to uh, offer a lamb, you could do that if you're a wealthy family. But if you were a poor family, guess what you could do? You could take a pair of turtle doves, pigeons, and that would be your sacrifice for the redemption of the firstborn, for the purification. So it tells us one thing. Mary and Joseph were very, very poor. This was a poor family's offering. And it's very detailed in the Bible. There's no, there's no coincidence why everything is written. Everything is important. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons was a poor family's redemption. So Jesus said, I have no home. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, you know, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. He truly was poor from the very beginning. Now, why would God send his son to a very poor family? Now, this is very poor. That's about a penny for two pigeons, about a penny. So half a penny for each one. Um, very poor family. Now, why would God send his son to a very poor family? Anybody have an insight on that? Too much thinking on Sunday morning, perhaps, right? But think about that. Does God really, I mean, going from this text, um, I don't think God is interested in how much we give our children materially. I think God picked this family because they would do what the Lord said to do. Raise them up in the fear of the Lord. And God's not interested in how much you give your kids materially. God is interested in how much you put into your kids spiritually. That's what Mary and Joseph could do. They could raise Jesus up in the admonition of the fear of the Lord, just like Proverbs said. And I think it's important, especially for us Americans and children uh, growing up in the West, that we, you know, we fill our home with everything that our kids could possibly even imagine to want. And we wonder why at 18 they don't want to go to church anymore. We wonder why they don't want to do anything anymore. Well, perhaps that was it. It's not always the case, but a lot of times it happens to families. And we uh, put a lot of value in the things we can give them materially and maybe not put as much value in the things we can give them spiritually. The Word of God, prayer, fellowship, evangelism, things that they need to do for the Lord. And um, they did. Mary and Joseph did. That's why I believe God picked them. There's no doubt. They were very poor. And uh, God doesn't care about the wealth of the parents. He cares about the spiritual condition that you could give your children. Now, one thing you know for sure, there's lots of blood in this chapter. Maybe that's why we don't like it too much for Christmas. Circumcision, right? Her purification. Now the turtle doves have to be sacrificed. Why is there so much blood in this chapter? It's leading you to a place, the cross. The cross begins to loom in this chapter, right over the baby. Oh, we don't like to think about the cross, but you have to. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Jesus had to die. Jesus had to bleed. And Jesus, of course, is the one who prepares the way. He set us all up. God has set it all up for Jesus. And Jesus is the only one who prepared his birth and prepared his death. He says, no man take my life from me. I lay it down. Nobody's going to take it up for me. I will lay it down. And he lays it down for us. It's all there. It's all at the beginning. Right? And it's such a blessing to read that in the book of Revelation, at the end, right? Genesis 3, you have the story. Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, I should say. First bloodshed, Genesis 4, Cain brings an offering. Revelation 7, all the people, tribe, tongue, and nation, the church up in heaven singing because they've been delivered from the great tribulation and they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. See, it's all the, it's the blood. And sum it all up, it's the blood. But it's here, the Christmas story is about the blood. Verse 25, and there was a man in Jerusalem. Now we get to more interesting stuff because it doesn't stop here. Like, that was very Jewish. That was Old Testament stuff. Yes, but it goes on. Remember, we're still living in the Old Testament at this point. Uh, even those in the New, 
The old covenant is still in place. The old covenant is still in place. Now the baby was, uh, there was a man in Jerusalem, I should say, whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Remember I told you Luke chapter 1? It was the Holy Spirit everywhere, filling people and causing them to praise and to pray and to have joy. And I prayed that day. I said, Lord, let us all be filled with God's Spirit. Oh, the, Moses prayed, let all God's people prophesy and be filled with God's Spirit. Isn't that a great prayer? Send out a Christmas card today. It says, I pray that you are filled with God's Spirit. Where would you get that from? The Christmas story. Everybody's filled with God's Spirit that are following him. Verse 26, but there's more. It was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Oh, my. Oh, my. This man was very in touch with God, even in the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, he had a very near and deep relationship with God. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when his parents brought the child Jesus to carry him out for the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. Now, I could relate a little bit to Simon, to Simeon here. The reason why is this. Um, the Magi had a star. The angels had, I mean, the, the shepherds had the angels to tell them about Jesus. Simon, Simon didn't have that. Simeon didn't have any of that. What did he have? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said, he is the Messiah. He is true. He is the one. He pointed him. It resonated with them. That's Jesus. That's the Messiah. And you know, the reason why I could relate to Simon, because I'd never seen an angel. I don't know. My wife's wonderful. But she's not literally an angel. I can call her an angel. And your wife's wonderful, too. And you might be calling her an angel, too. You might have seen an angel. That's true. But I've never seen a real angel. And I've never seen a guiding star taking me to Jesus. But when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit told me, that's Jesus. That's true. That's what happened to you, too. The Holy Spirit said, that's Jesus. You follow him. I could relate to Simon. I could truly do. Jesus was the Savior. And he came and he saw the Lord. Now the Holy Spirit had told them. The Holy Spirit had told them that he would, not die, he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. He was righteous. He was a devout man. He was a true man of God. And he was looking for the consolation of Israel. That's another word in the Old Testament for the Messiah. Because he was going to be the the consolation of Israel. He was going to be the one that would bring consolation to Israel. Why? Oh, Israel had gone through so many wars, so many bad things. And he knew about Jesus before he met him. What a blessing, isn't it? And he was the only Jew in this case who was looking for Jesus. He was waiting for the Messiah to come. And, um, you know, people guess today, when is Jesus coming? When is Jesus coming? And, and, and at the end of the year, they make predictions. Of course, you'll see it. You'll go to the grocery store if you go there and, and you'll see Jesus coming 2021. Ten reasons why Jesus is coming 2021. Ten reasons Jesus is coming tomorrow. Everybody makes predictions, right? But here was a man who knew from God he would not die. And I could imagine throughout his lifetime looking at the calendar and his birthday was probably really interesting. Oh, another year. And he was probably getting excited about getting old. Anybody here excited about getting old? <laughs> Nobody? Frank is. Right? This man was excited. On his birthday he says, man, I'm another year closer to Jesus. Another year, I'm going to see the Messiah soon. And as he got older and older and older, he said, why are you so excited about being old? He said, because I'm going to go see Jesus. See, a place today, too. Every day we get older, every day, every year, we're closer to see Jesus. Just like Simon was. He was excited. And every birthday, he got excited. He got a card. And he would send up, probably he sent out the cards. What a blessing. Looking forward to seeing the Messiah. I'm coming one more year older. Uh, and he was an old man by now. And he knew that by the Spirit, that day, the Spirit told him, Go into the temple. And he got up that morning, probably thinking like any other morning, but this was different. And what did he expect to see? What did he, he comes to the temple? Where is he? Where'd he go? Looking around. Now, the book of Malachi says that the Messiah would come suddenly to his temple. And the Jewish thought at that point is that the, the, the Messiah would come down in a cloud, right to the temple. Suddenly, he would appear. And they were always looking. There's a reason why Satan took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. Because that's how the Messiah would come. He told him, throw yourself down and the angels will catch you. Well, this was a, a Jewish thinking at the time from Malachi that the Messiah would come exactly that way. So he's probably looking, looking at the pinnacle of the temple, looking around, nothing. Nothing there, nothing there. And then he sees a family. 
carpenter and a little teenage girl and Jesus. And he was excited. Where are we at? Oh, verse 29. And he said, Lord, you're releasing me. You're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the people. Oh, this was the proclamation of Simon, Simon, which you have prepared in the presence of all the people, a light to the uh, revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Oh, he must have picked up that baby. I'm sure the family was wondering, what is going on with this old man? Well, you know, older people love to hold babies. You know, you know, walk around and, you know, grandma wants to hold the baby. You know, older people want to hold babies. There's nothing weird about that, but it was weird that they didn't know him. And he begins to sing and begins to, uh, maybe not a song, but a praise to God for this baby. Simon held the baby. What an amazing sight. What did he see? A baby. But he saw more than a baby. He saw the Messiah. And he had tremendous faith in God that he can now depart in peace. Right? He can now say, Lord, I've seen it all. I'm wondering why he said, Lord, give me 20 more years. I would have said that. Lord, I want to see what this baby does. I want to see what the Messiah is going to do. Don't you want to see what the Messiah is going to do? But you know, he had just enough to know that Jesus was here. And that's all he needed to know. That's it. Lord, I've seen it all. I've seen Jesus. I can go. I can depart in peace. Lord, I've seen it all. This is the faith. This is what the book of Hebrews talks about. Hebrews 11.1. 1. About faith and what is faith? It's a substance of things seen, right? Not seen, right? It's the hope. He's seen it. Abraham didn't get the full picture, didn't get to see Jesus. Abraham didn't do it. Moses didn't get it. Elijah didn't get it. But they had faith, says in Hebrews 11. They had faith that one day Christ will come and they will rejoice. And they will rejoice in the faithfulness of God. He will bring it to pass. That's what this man is saying. God's going to bring it to pass. Don't worry. I've seen it all. That's all I need to see, Lord, that you are going to do it. Oh, that's tremendous faith, isn't it? Can you do that today? That God gives you a promise. says, Lord, I don't need to see it. I know it's going to happen. Why? Because it's in there. I know it's going to happen because it's in there. And I can trust you with it. And that's because you're a faithful God. Boy, that's faith. And this man had the Holy Spirit. and He had tremendous faith. And um, your servant, your salvation, he says. It's all you, Lord, right? Your servant, your salvation. It's going to be you. You're going to be the light. You're going to be to your people, Israel. Salvation, the glory of Israel. That's how, that's how man filled the Spirit talks. Not I, but you, Lord. You're going to do this, Lord. You're going to do that. It's your people. It's your salvation. It's your. That's awesome. Verse 33. And his father and mother were amazed at these things which, saw, uh, which were being said about him. And Simon blessed them and said to Mary, it's going to be tough, Mary. This is another thing we have to remember as Christians. You know, just because we have the good news of God doesn't mean it's just going to be bed of roses. In fact, he didn't promise a bed of roses. Promise a crown of thorn. Promise some difficult things. And it says, Mary's going to be difficult. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel for a sign to the opposed, uh, for uh, a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end, and thoughts for, uh, and uh, your own soul to the end, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Oh, Mary's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. He's going to reveal the hearts. He's going to reveal the hearts of many. And this child is going to split Israel. He's going to split Israel down the middle. Those who believe and he don't, those who don't believe. He's going to split every Jewish family. And to this day, that's very true. Jewish families are divided, even to this day, whether they believe in Jesus or not. Synagogues, where Jewish people go, are divided. Does the rabbi believe in Jesus? Or maybe I shouldn't go. And other families say, well... Should we allow families that believe in Jesus, even though they're Jews, to the synagogues? It's a big, big fight in Israel today, even to this day. Synagogues are split whether people that believe that Jesus is the Messiah, being Jewish, can go into a synagogue. It's like, it's like going to a church and saying, well, if you believe Jesus is the Messiah, you can't come. That would be obviously weird, a church. But it's the same thing in the synagogues. Families are split. Should we invite, um, you know, cousin, um, you know, Johnny? He's a bit of a weirdo guy because uh, he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Should we invite him over for Hanukkah? It, things like that happen in Jewish families. Well, Simon said it would happen. It would be for the revelation of people's hearts. It will split Israel down the middle, but it'll split other families down the middle. It'll split your family. It'll split my family, those who believe and those who don't believe. Why? Because Jesus brought a sword. He brought a sword. Now, he is the Prince of Peace, no doubt, but because people's choices toward him, people's hearts are going to be revealed, and they're going to make that decision to break away from Jesus or go toward Jesus. See, the decision is not Jesus. 
He wants us all. He wants all men to be saved. The decision is always men. If they're going to oppose him or they're going to accept him. But every heart's going to be exposed, uh, Simon said. And it's going to touch your heart, Mary. It's going to touch your soul because a sword is going to pierce you. The cross comes up again. When did that happen? At 33 years old, Mary was standing there as a widow. Joseph was, had died and he saw Jesus, his son, her son, dying for her sins and dying for us. Oh, it's going to be piercing. And it's going to be difficult, Mary. All through your life, you're going to be bound with this idea that you are the mother of Jesus. And he's not going to be liked and he's not going to be welcomed. And people are going to spit at him and people are going to turn away from him. But you stay true because it's going to be hard. But God is going to deliver you. God's going to deliver you. Verse 36, and we're done. There was a prophetess, another woman. And Luke is full of these wonderful, amazing women, full of the Spirit. Ladies, take note of that. Man full of the Spirit. Young and old, Mary, a teenager, Elizabeth older. This woman was quite older. In fact, by the, the, the census of the time, people about 30 years old was the life expectation. She was 84. Quite a bit older. Verse 36, there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, and she lived in her, uh, with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow, to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of Jesus to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She was a prophetess. She was quite a bit old, 84. She's seen tragedy in her life. And um, this is a side note, but you can look it on your own. I encourage you to do that. Read a, the this history of the Jews 100 years before Jesus was born. That period of time was absolute horrible. It was absolute horrible because there were civil wars. There were so many people trying to control Judea. Try to control Jerusalem. There were the Hasmoneans. There were Syria. There was Pompeii and Rome and Julius Caesar and the Herodians. And war after war after war, and her husband died during that time. Seven years she was married, and then bloodshed came into her family. I'm sure she lost family. I'm sure she lost loved ones. And Jerusalem was filled with blood. And Jerusalem was filled with foreigners. And Jerusalem was filled with the power of Rome. It's to make anybody bitter. It's to make anybody say, Lord, if you're a God of love, why are you letting this happen? It's enough for somebody to say, God, you can't be real. Look at all the misery and the suffering of this world. But what does she do? She actually gave herself for prayer. See, this is, what, um, this is what we could do. You know, where sorrow fills our hearts and difficult things come, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to prayer and to fasting. It says she did that. She gave herself to prayer and to fasting. By the way, she was from the northern tribe. And you know what happened to the northern tribe? She was from the tribe of Asher. Uh, Syria had come in years, Assyria had come in years and years earlier, and her family probably had to flee. Had to flee because the Assyrians had destroyed her land. It's for anybody to be bitter and say, well, God, I just only suffer, I only suffer in this life. What's going on? She gave herself to prayer, and she gave herself to prayer to God that he would do something, that he would intervene and do something about it. And she saw the baby, and she said, God, you answer my prayer. That's it. God, you answer my prayer. I've been praying this long. I ask you to intervene. And who did you send? Jesus. Jesus. And she goes out and she tells everybody, it says. She went and she began to tell everybody uh, to speak of Jesus to all, all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Oh, it's such a beautiful thing. The Savior is born. She's there. He's there. She's there. Simon's there, Mary's there, the Savior is born. It says, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. Wow, what a chapter, quite a bit of it. His arrival changed everything. His arrival changes everything. <clears throat> Absolutely true. This world will never be the same again. When that day happened, when Jesus was born, it changed everything. It changed everything for you, for me, for my family, for your family. And it changed things for Israel. Israel will never be the same again. Because now people have to make a choice. Jews have to make a choice to follow the Messiah or to follow their traditions. And for us, it changes things too. To follow the Messiah or to follow our traditions. To follow what the unbelief of many people's hearts. 
And it's amazing because the Bible says that this, is, this was a sign. It was a sign in the, in the time of Isaiah to a wicked king called Ahaz. A wicked king called Ahaz. And God gave him a sign. He said, God's going to protect you. He is going to protect you by the birth of this baby. He was called Emmanuel at that time. And what did Ahaz do? Ahaz was a wicked king and he didn't believe. Even though God protected him, he didn't believe. He didn't trust God. He went to Assyria to try to get help. And then Assyria came and took him captive. It's to say Jesus gives us a choice. Emmanuel, he's been born. He offers salvation. He offers salvation, but you know, it is useless. Christmas is useless unless you believe in him. Christmas is absolutely useless unless you believe in him. Pastor, can you say that? I said, well, that's what happened to Israel. That's what happened to the people of God at that time. What good was it for them that Jesus came? Unless they believed. Unless they believe. Why are we celebrating Christmas? Because Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. He offers salvation to all who believed. You know, it's like, uh, you know, the Titanic, right? It's sinking. The lifeboat shows up and people begin to, ha, huh, I don't like that boat. I don't like the color. I don't like the way the, 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 the captain of that lifeboat is yelling at people. I don't like the way he's telling people to get in. Otherwise, they're going to die. Sounds negative. I'm going to stay in the Titanic. And you know what? It's like that today. Christmas. Christmas is the lifeboat. Jesus is the lifeboat. The message of Christmas is the lifeboat. And people stand with their arms folded and go, I don't like the way the pastor's going. I don't like the way that preacher's saying. I don't like he's too negative. It's too harsh. Sounds like he's yelling at people to get in the lifeboat. What's the hurry? The Titanic is just fine. Oh, no, my friend. The Titanic is not just fine. Titanic did sink. Unfortunately, took a lot of people with them. In fact, more people died than they actually were saved. But the lifeboats were there. Do you realize that? That the lifeboats were there and people would not get in because they would just say, eh, we're going to be fine. And the lifeboats left empty. And the boat of Jesus today is calling you and it's calling me to get in. Why? The lifeboat's coming. Ahaz, you got a lifeboat, Ahaz? Why don't you get in? I'm going to go to Assyria. It's much better, I heard. This child thing, Emmanuel, that's not going to work. And he didn't believe. But God made a promise a couple of chapters later in Isaiah. And he says, you know, there's a day coming when all the Jewish people are going to come back. And I'm going to regather them, chapter 11, a second time. A second time, he says. I'm going to gather them and I'm going to bring them back at a time of great trouble. And I'm going to bring them back to show them salvation. And at that time, he says, if they believe... The wolf will lie down with the lamb. A child will lead them. A cobra will not hurt you. Why? The kingdom of Jesus will be here. When? He says, at the time that he gathers Israel a second time. Isn't that amazing? Well, what's so amazing? They've been regathering since 1948. In fact, within your lifetime, within your parents' lifetime, within your grandparents' lifetime, things have been happening all over the world that is telling us that Jesus is about to come. It's telling you that it's about to come. He says Christmas is coming again. Why? The Jews have been regathered. They've been regathering. And times are going to get tougher. And you know what? You're going to see more Jews going back to Israel. Mark my word. You're going to see them going back to Israel. Look at the news. Look at friends. Look at Europe. Look at America. Jews are getting out of here. Why? Because they know troubled times are coming and they need to go to Israel. There's a calling for them. Why? God said it. It would happen. And God's people have been under bondage and under sin for such a long time. And they finally cried out to God. That's going to happen again. The Jews are going to cry out for Jesus to come. But we don't have to wait that long because we know what's coming. We know that Christmas is going to happen again. We know that Jesus is going to come. We know that there's going to be signs in the heavens, marvelous signs in the heavens that will tell us that his arrival is about to happen. And you'll know. But what are you going to do with Christmas in the meantime? What are you going to do with Christmas in the meantime? It matters not if you celebrated it. It matters not if you celebrate it. It only matters if you believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Then you can celebrate it, and then you can proclaim it. Gathering with families and things like that is wonderful. It's good. But what does it mean? And what will it do to you? Unless you have him as Lord, Messiah, and Savior. That's the key to Christmas. That's it. That's what there's bloodshed. That's what there's Simeon with the Holy Spirit proclaiming it. That's what there's going to be people that are going to be alive when Jesus comes. Just like Simeon. Just like Anna. Not to be bitter. 
Not to be against the things of God, but just to pray and to seek for the consolation of Israel. Oh, may the Lord give us consolation. May they give us comfort knowing that Jesus is going to come. And the same for you and same for my family. Christmas will not mean anything to you until you realize that you're a sinner and you need that baby to save you. Amen. That's what Mary did. I need a Savior too. You're right, Mary. You need a Savior too. I need a Savior too. And it's that baby that you have. And he will be for the rise and fall of many. Are you going to rise with Jesus today? Or are you going to fall with Jesus today? Every human being on this earth will go through that. The rise. Oh, Jesus has taken up to the highest heights. He's given us his spirit. He's forgiven our sins. He's forgotten our sins. And he's redeemed us. Oh, to the highest heights. But it could be the lowest depths to celebrate Christmas and to not receive him. It's like being in a sinking ship and rejecting the lifeboat. I don't understand, but I did it. I did it for 20 years. Christmas! But no Jesus. Christmas dinner! But no Savior. Gifts! No forgiveness of sin. Then until that day came, that's when Christmas came. And it's coming again, my friend. And you get ready. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus. Oh, it started back then. It did not just start at the cross. It began when you came into the swirl to shed your blood, Lord, for us. Ultimately, yes, the blood of Christ at the cross that saves us from all sin and redeems us from our wicked sins and our inability to keep the law. Lord, we praise you and thank you that we wouldn't have a cross unless this event happened. We wouldn't have salvation unless these events took place. Thank you for Simon or Simeon. Thank you for Anna. Thank you for Joseph and for Mary and these men and women who trusted you, the shepherds and magi, those who proclaimed you at a time of very difficult things happening in their land. And Lord, we don't doubt that there are many difficult things happening in our land, but we look for the consolation of Israel. We look for the light to the Gentiles. And we have Christmas. And Lord, thank you for saving us. And we proclaim your good news until you come. Because we know, Lord, Christmas will come again. It won't be the same way. This time it will be for the judgment of the nations, for the establishment of your kingdom. Lord, help us to get as many people into the lifeboat tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas.